Stay tuned to Focus on PBS 39 for an in-depth look at the issues that matter to you. In this episode, we explore history, community, education, and health, starting with an investigation into a growing number of drug-related deaths in our region. I only wish that I had understood better how difficult the struggle with narcotics addiction could be. We share a local mother's story. Plus, we take you on a tour through the tree-lined streets of why I'm missing Berks County and introduce you to the borough's founders. Community, I think that's a key word that I would keep emphasizing over and over again. These men were community-oriented. Don't go anywhere. An all-new episode of Focus starts right now. Focus is for our community. Focus showcases the people, the places, and the issues that matter to you. Focus on what matters. You never know what you're going to see when you tune into Focus. Support for Focus is provided by Univest. Banking, insurance, investments, fellowship community, continuing care with spirit, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. I'm Laura McHugh. We've spent the past few months researching several long-term projects and want to give you a sneak peek tonight at what you'll see in the months ahead on PBS 39. We begin with a focus on health and a problem some have characterized as an epidemic. It's an issue that has major impacts on criminal justice and public policy and as Brittany Garzillo explains, it's tearing families apart. Thanks, Laura. It's heroin. Its use has more than doubled among young adults ages 18 to 25 in the past decade, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. For some, the cost of drug addiction could mean the difference between life and death, affecting not only victims, but friends and family. A love for music runs in the Rawls family. So much so that Tina Rawls from Emmaus and her late husband Jeff included it in their son's name. James Atticus, John Paul George, and Ringo Rawls. A mouthful of a legal name for the son of two New York defense attorneys at the time. I thought that this kid would never be shy if he had a name like this because he'd be explaining it for the rest of his life and he would never be prejudiced, not with Atticus in the name. Tina's only biological son, in addition to two stepchildren. And of course, James, as we called him, sweet baby James. James's photos decorate almost every room of her home. Tina's motherly love beaming bright with each picture she shows us. Because I was so, you know, one of those overbearing mothers who can't be without my child, you know. <laughs> Today, Tina continues to practice law and fight battles for others, but perhaps her most difficult battles are the ones in her own life. In 2006, her husband died of lung cancer, a loss that changed her life in more ways than she could imagine. When I, I look at that picture and I see James's stricken face and I think, it's a precursor. It's all there in that picture how difficult his life is about to become. After his father's death, James fell into depression and went into counseling. At 11 years old, James began smoking marijuana. At 12, he entered a drug and alcohol treatment program. It just, you know, spiraled one, one drug after another, and he was diagnosed with polysubstance dependence disorder, which basically meant that he was not addicted to any one substance, but because of the trauma in his life, the post-traumatic stress disorder um, and depression, he was self-medicating and he was addicted to being high, to avoiding those feelings. The next four years he sought treatment and discovered himself as a musician. But in July of 2012, with 11 months of sobriety under his belt, James suffered an accident. He attended a party where fireworks were shot off. One hit James in the foot, causing second and third degree burns. During recovery, he took narcotic painkillers. About six weeks after stopping, he relapsed back into drug use. 
and I started quickly realizing he's smoking pot again and he's taking pills and he's got himself arrested and kicked out of the school again and it all started to spiral very rapidly downhill. A hill that eventually led to heroin. Six months after Tina believes he first tried it, James and a friend from his recovery group smoked heroin together. The next day, Tina found him dead in his bed. He was only 18. He hardly had time to make a mark on the world. The name that Tina always wanted people to remember was remembered when we asked Lehigh County Coroner Scott Grimm. James is one of the 88 drug-related deaths he saw in 2014. Very severe, almost epidemic uh, situation here in the county. And it's not only here in Lehigh County, it's uh, across Pennsylvania, it's across the United States that we're seeing an increase of drug-related deaths. He says of the 78 drug-related deaths since January, almost one-third of them include the use of heroin. If we um, exceed 100 or, and even reach, you know, 110, 120, uh, that's going to be an all-time high for drug-related deaths within Lehigh County. With the help of friends, Tina discovered recorded versions of the songs James wrote throughout treatment. The first verse is to his dad. It's called Don't Cry. James dedicates three verses to the ones he loved and lost. And we played it at his service and all of a sudden it made sad sense. Tina says she knows her son didn't commit suicide, but feels he knew the risks of his addiction. It was in his mind that he might not make it. And um, I only wish that I had understood better how difficult the struggle with narcotics addiction could be. The lyrics James once wrote are now displayed on a memorial statue outside of the Emmaus Public Library. You can't even begin to imagine the damage that's being done until you really start to look hard at how many people we've lost and who they really were apart from their addiction. Today, Tina advocates for awareness on this issue and keeps in mind the words of her son, her head held high for perhaps not one, but two of her angels in the sky. For Focus, I'm Brittany Garzillo reporting. This season, our team will explore this issue further in a Focus special report. Thank you, Brittany. To help us learn more right now, we welcome Tim Munch, the executive director of the Lehigh Valley Drug and Alcohol Intake Unit. Tim, this piece really explored the impact this issue is having on families, but it's also impacting the criminal justice system as well as the health care system that you work in. How is it affecting the ability to get treatment? Well, one of the biggest issues we have is finding beds for people who are addicted to heroin and, and need detoxification. The beds used to be we could see a person in the morning and we could get them in treatment by the afternoon. Today we're waiting three, four, five days in order to get someone in treatment. And in that time, a person gets sick and they can do illegal acts. They, could, they have to do what they have to do to get their hands on the drugs. They don't feel the sickness of the withdrawal. Mm. What's the increase like that you're seeing in heroin usage? Well, th there's been a very large jump in the last three to five years. Um, I don't have a specific number, but it, it's very evident in the fact that I, I would say three out of every five people who come into our office have a heroin addiction. And it, it, it's opiates, it's not just heroin, it's, it's all types of opiates. And that's interesting. Are you seeing that it's because of the use of, for example, those opioid prescription painkillers, that it's that gateway to heroin? We are seeing more and more of, of individuals who come in having used prescription drugs, and more young people. We never used to see that. They used to be more of the marijuana and alcohol. But because of the prescription drugs, whether they get them, a lot of them are getting them through various reasons. We're seeing a lot of athletes who were given that because of an injury, started taking it to help with their injury, but then began to believe they couldn't play without that drug. They start overusing their drug. They can't get it anymore, the prescription drug. Of course, then they go out and they buy heroin and now they're physically addicted, and then the, the addiction pattern begins. So, Tim, this is taking a serious toll on the criminal justice system as well, and I understand that you've been involved in drug court, which is brand new to mm -hmm. Northampton County. How and why was this established? 
Well, the, the, the prisons are full of people with drug and alcohol problems. And many of the people, who, they're sick, they have a disease. The AMA has considered addiction as a disease. So therefore, people that are sick shouldn't be in prison. They should get, get the help they need. Although it's very difficult because these people commit criminal acts in order to get the money, in order to get the drugs. So the, the drug court is, is wonderful in the fact that it pulls together all of the resources necessary and it's a very structured group so that the individual has to stay on task and has to stay. And, and an addict will tell you their biggest problem is, is staying structured, staying focused and, and giving them the resources. Um, they're, they're now doing studies on the brain and then it takes up to three months before the damage done to the brain uh, is well enough that the person can even manage a schedule, figure out wh how to do things in a consistent manner. So you have to stay involved with them. They have to stay involved with the structured environment in order to let the brain heal, number one. And then of course, many of them have never li lived a responsible life. They have to learn those responsibilities. Drug court helps with all of this. Even though cameras aren't typically allowed in the courtroom, I recently sat in on a session of drug court and the people that you're seeing, they have to report every single week. Who are the agencies that are involved in keeping that on track? Well, that's the beauty of it. For, for one of the first times, the criminal justice system and the treatment uh, teams are together. So that there's probation, there's, uh, there's drug and alcohol treatment. If necessary, children and youth gets pulled in there. There is the county there, the, the funding entities from the county are involved there. And any other entity that needs to be pulled in is pulled in and reported. All of the entities are pe individuals that are involved with the, with the client and, and with getting them help. So it's a, there's, there's no questions left out there. It all gets handled right there. And you can follow up and see, has the person in fact done what they're supposed to do? So it, the merger of treatment and the legal system is, is long time coming and it's working. It's really working very well. Well, Tim, thank you very much for your insight and we hope to stay in touch as we continue to cover this issue. Thank you. We now turn our focus to history and to Berks County's Borough of Wyoming Missing, a tree-lined suburb of Reading that knits together three themes, community, family, and industry. Here with the story of Wyoming Missing's founding fathers, Focus reporter Grover Silcox. Thanks, Laura. Ferdinand Toon and Henry Janssen, two German immigrants, came to Berks County in the late 19th century and became leaders in the textile industry. These men saw their business and the community around it as equally important, and so they wove both into a lasting legacy. The community they helped create still thrives, and the spirit of giving that poured out of them continues through their families, foundations, and public projects. Here's the story of two men who found success in America and in so doing created Wyoming Missing, an American dream. Just west of Reading, with a population of 10,000, lies the borough of Wyoming Missing. Its tree-lined streets, well-appointed homes, parkland, and a library, even many of its traditions harken back to an earlier time. had everything that I needed, that's for certain. Dave Bauscher, who served as Wyomissing's police chief and also borough manager, has lived and worked here all of his 79 years. But we used to spend a lot of our time outside in these streets. On this day, he shows us his childhood home on Garfield Street that was purchased new by his dad in 1935. Wyomissing was one of the first planned communities in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. That planning began in the late 1890s with two of the borough's founders, Ferdinand Toon and Henry Janssen. They were German immigrants who came to Berks County as young men and built one of the largest textile companies in history, Wyomissing Industries. They had this vision of suburban development. Community, I think that's a key word that I would keep emphasizing over and over again. These men were community oriented. Toon and Janssen saw the development of Waya Missing as key to the success of Waya Missing Industries. They became both successful businessmen and urban planners as a result. Mr. Toon had a background in business and financial things. He was very, very good with that. And Mr. Janssen's education was in technical things. And the two complemented each other perfectly. 
1926, their annual... Mark Vaught, a researcher who lectures on the history of Toon and Janssen, notes the irony of their first meeting. They did not know each other while they were in Germany. It was only later after they came to the U.S. They were introduced by a mutual friend and discovered that they were born within a week of each other. George Edmonds, who grew up in Wyomissing and wrote about it in his book, Wyomissing, an American Dream, chuckles over the idea that these two men didn't meet till they came to America. It's a mystical, magical um, experience here that these two men were born only a half a mile apart or so in the same city called Barman, but a city that had its own identity as a braiding capital. In 1892, they formed a partnership, moved to Reading, and established the textile machine works to build and service braiding machines. Their original shop on Cedar Street now houses Barbet Industries. Owned and operated by Frank Luz and his son Joe, the company makes braiding, much of it on the very machines made by Toon and Janssen. This is the, one of the buildings that uh, Toon and Janssen got their start in back in the late 19th century when they went into business. Some of the equipment that we run today were made by Textile Machine Works. Women in the late 1890s, the Victorian period, wore dresses that touched the ground. Braiding along the hemline helped prevent fraying. In today's domestic market, Frank and his son make tassels and fringe for flags, among other specialty products. Over the years, we've had new foreign Japanese and Chinese made machines in our plant, and we can wear those out in a few years' time. It's the quality of steel that goes into them. Whereas with Textile Machine Works, it was a very high-grade steel, and if you maintain them, oil them, lubricate them, they show very, very little wear. They'll run for another hundred years. In 1896, Toon and Janssen moved the textile machine works to Wyomissing along the Reading Railroad. For one dollar, they were given some land over there, and they moved their business very quickly. By 1900, the partners were not only making braiding machines, but also braiding products through a new company they created called the Narrow Fabric Company. In 1906, they brought in fellow German Gustav Oberlander, who also became a partner. That same year, they created Berkshire Knitting Mills and began making women's full-fashioned or seamed stockings on their own patented machine called the Redding. Well, the basic famous Redding knitting machine always boggles my mind when you realize they had 130,000 parts. And they're all absolutely controlled to the minute. I was fortunate enough to actually make some of those, make a lot of the parts and also assemble some of the machines. And, and there's nothing like it. Toon and Janssen incorporated their three companies as Wyomissing Industries, and business took off especially as demand for full-fashioned hosiery soared. They also took the lead in developing the borough of Wyomissing. They built their homes here, funded affordable housing for their employees, planned the layout of the whole community, donated land, and backed one public project after another. The trees. If you drive into Wyomissing on a hot summer day, the temperature drops probably five degrees, maybe more, because of the trees. That's my grandfather and Mr. Janssen. They did that. They did not just the boulevards where the big fancy houses are, but all the side streets. There's very affordable housing, and it was so that people could live there and work at the mills and walk to work. They did that planning. They laid it all out. I think my great-grandfather would be very proud that his legacy continues into the 2015th year. We will never forget him, and I try to remind people how wonderful he and Mr. Toon were in the founding of the Why Missing Industries. Henry Janssen died in 1948, and Ferdinand Toon in 1949, ending a partnership that lasted 56 years. Why a Missing Industries is gone now, 
but the partners' good works live on through their foundations and a community which serves as their legacy. For Focus, I'm Grover Zilcox reporting. Thank you, Grover. We now turn our focus to community. Founded 150 years ago, the Salvation Army has grown into an international organization serving 127 countries. That bright crimson shield, no matter where you go, is a symbol of hope and help in times of need. Whether you're in India, Africa, Central America, or in the Lehigh Valley, where the Salvation Army has community centers called CORES in Allentown, Bethlehem, Easton, and Penn Argyle. I recently spent the day at 8th and Turner Streets in Allentown, where 500 students got their school year started with the Salvation Army. Hello everyone, I'd like to welcome you to the 2015 Salvation Army Back to School Carnival. We're having our annual back to school carnival where we try to help out as many kids in the community from local schools as possible, uh, from grades one through 12. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Our back to school eight, carnival nine, takes seven. place in Allentown and Easton, and we provide anything and everything we can to get a child ready to succeed academically when they go back to school. Okay, I can take 10 more. I got here at 7 o'clock in the morning, and I'm waiting for the bop for my kids. We're expecting well over 500. So far, the line's as long as it's been since I've been doing this in, in 10 years. They're trying to get some supplies and new book bags so they can start off the school year right. Are you excited to start school? Yeah. Because it's so fun. We like to be in school. It may not sound like a lot for a lot of people to get your child a haircut, a new backpack, new shoes, new clothing, and to fill the backpack with the notebooks and pencils and everything. But in all honesty, when, when you have a single parent or a low-income family, it, it means a lot, especially if they have two, three, four children. It really goes a long way, and it really makes a difference in those families' lives. I got one good notebook, coloring pencils, and a couple extra pencils I'm, I'm going to need for school. And then I got a pencil case with a ruler, an uh, extra pencil, and a pen. It is only 12.52, and we have already served 467 people. And there's probably at least a good 200 people still out there. We were only prepared for 523 people. OK, I'm ready for my next 10. Come on, ladies and gentlemen. The, the Back to School Carnival the, this year assisted children from 56 different schools and it reaches out into the suburbs. Uh, we had children from the Southerly High School District and the Parkland School District and some of the more affluent school districts come to us for service. The, the need is everywhere. This is why we say and we tell the community, if you have it, please donate it. For events like this, there's a lot of families in need. I hope you all have good luck and a great school year. Finally, we turn our focus to education and a special summer camp called Production U. Every summer at PBS 39, we open our doors and our studios to talented high school students from across the region. Here's a glimpse behind the scenes of PBS 39's Production U. PBS 39 Production U gives students from the Lehigh Valley and beyond the opportunity to come together and produce a newscast of their very own. You learn skills of getting a deadline, communicating with your whole team. You need to make sure that everyone's on the same page so that everything comes out the same. You learn like how to actually be in a business-oriented area. you learn how to depend on a team because if you don't succeed then the whole team doesn't succeed so you have to work hard for everybody. I like to kind of bring what I learned to my own projects and meeting a lot of these people who want to do the same thing as me is really helpful and exciting. You really kind of learn how to work as a team and work with other people and that's a skill that a lot of us need now and it's something that I've grown a lot in 
We break students up into two different teams. This year, one group wanted to work on the local arts scene, the other group wanted to explore educational opportunities in the Lehigh Valley, and each student was assigned a specific role. We had producers, anchors, reporters, editors, videographers, and even directors and assistant directors who all worked together to make a great finished product. Working with the staff was an amazing opportunity. I'm really glad that I got to do it. Uh, they know so much and they're so knowledgeable on what they do that it's really inspiring to be able to work with them. The best part of production here is, I would have to say meeting other people and meeting people who are professional in their fields, being able to work with them because uh, they're all really great people. I really do feel like I got a lot out of it and it's um, eye-opening in the sense that there's a lot of different things that I want to do <laughs> after high school. Production news is really fun. I would like to do it again. Hopefully this I, I could keep this and this could just move forward with me in my career. And to be able to have your decisions serve as a very substantial role in the end process, it's perfect. It's great. It's an amazing experience. We're so proud of their hard work this week and hope they made a production you can be proud of. Thank you to everyone in the community and especially right here at PBS 39 who made production you possible. In the months ahead, we'll learn more about each of the topics featured in this program. Brittany's been working extensively on the heroin issue. That's right, Laura. Later this season, sometime in November, we'll delve deep into that issue and show you this focused special report. And Grover spent his summer in beautiful tree-lined Wyoming. That's right. And in the spring, we're going to have a full-blown documentary expanding on the extraordinary success story of Toon and Janssen and Wyoming. And I'm spending some time working on the 150th anniversary of the Salvation Army and their roots here in the Lehigh Valley do uh, reach back into the late 1800s. So we'll learn more about all these topics in the season ahead. Well, thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next week for our monthly art series, First Fridays on Focus. Until then, remember to focus on what matters.